you all hear me now with this? I've got so many introductions to make. This will probably take about 20 minutes. Is that all right? But I, I'm David Gargan. I'm delighted to uh, welcome all of you, and especially our speakers tonight, uh, to the forum. Uh, we, we, this forum continues to attract just first-class individuals, and nowhere is that more clear than uh, tonight. Um, this forum, as uh, you should know, uh, the co-sponsors, uh, the Center for Public Leadership, which I'm here representing, the HKS Healthcare Policy Program, the Malcolm Weiner Center for Social Policy, as well as the Institute of Politics, and we thank all of you. This actually is an annual lecture. It's gonna be done in conversation style, but it's the Seymour and Ruth Harris lecture. Uh, Seymour, Dr. Seymour Harris was a world-renowned economist here at Harvard for a great many years, and he was an advisor to the president in both the Kennedy and the Johnson years, years of enormous growth. He was a man who brought to a Department of Economics here at Harvard, which at the time was regarded as rather stuffy and academic. Uh, he brought the notion that, no, we ought to have more applied policy as well as research. Uh, and he worked with some wonderful people, Alvin Hansen, an iconic figure, Paul Samuelson, John Kenneth Galbraith, and many others. So know that we're here uh, as part of the Harris Lecture. Now let me talk to you about our lecturer, or conversationalist. Uh, I'm very proud to present to you uh, the Surgeon General of the United States, Vice Admiral, Vice, 39 years old, Vice Admiral, isn't that unbelievable? Uh, Vivek, Vivek Murthy, and uh, I've known Vivek for a number of years. Uh, he and my daughter were friends. My daughter is here tonight. Where is Catherine? Where did she go? There you are. Hi, sweetie. Um, uh, but they, they went to school together. Uh, Vivek, is a, uh, his, his parents came here from India, uh, and he learned a great deal about the care of individuals while with his parents and when they moved to Florida early, early on. And uh, he uh, went on and got his bachelor's degree from Harvard, his MD and MD MBA uh, from Yale. We'll forgive you that. Uh, <coughs> completed his residency training at Brigham and Women's Hospital and the Harvard Medical School, where he later joined the faculty as an internal medicine physician and instructor. What was really interesting in his early career is how much he cared for his patients. He started programs not only in the United States but in India uh, that, uh, that served some 45,000 people. Uh, and came to the national spotlight, and it's extraordinary the jump a generation for the attorney uh, for the Surgeon General's job. But uh, President Obama said, "Yes, let's." Uh, he represents the face of the future. Let's make him our Surgeon General, uh, which he's now doing. You should know that in the office of uh, Surgeon General, uh, you have two responsibilities. First is to communicate to the public about personal and, and, uh, and public health issues, uh, which he's doing, and I hope tonight we're going to be hearing more about his call for the folk country to focus more on drugs, drug abuse, especially opio opioids. He's written a letter, he's the only Surgeon General in history to write a letter to every doctor in the country to discuss this problem. He's leading the crusade on it, and it's about time because it's one of the most under uh, reported issues of our time. The other thing is the other, that the other thing that the Surgeon General does is oversee the operations of the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps, comprised of approximately 6,700 health officers in nearly 800 locations around the world, and to every one of them, he is the Vice Admiral. Now, finally, I know you'll, let's get to the chase here. Um, I want to introduce our moderator, no stranger to many of you here because he's a star member of this faculty. Amitabh Chandra is the Malcolm Weiner Professor of Social Policy and Director of the Health Policy Research at the Kennedy School. Uh, he's on all sorts of boards at Harvard. He teaches undergraduates. He teaches here at the Kennedy School and he teaches at the business school as well as the executive education program. And I just want to tell you, not only as a health economist, but he is a wonderful, public citizen who has jumped in. We have a, a variety of experiments now working between the Kennedy School and the School of Public Health. 
Emmett Hub builds the bridges for that and has, has volunteered to help us with students and all sorts of things. And I can't imagine a better person to, have to be the conversationalist uh, with Vivek. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, David, and welcome, Vivek, Dr. Thank Murthy. Um, so I have two announcements to make. The first is we're going to do this conversation in Hindi and Kannada. <laughs> it's just a joke. Uh, uh, the second is that if you are live tweeting, and we encourage you to live tweet, use at surgeon underscore general, not at surgeon general, because my sense is that at surgeon general is like some sort of a punk rock band. So yes. you want to make sure you get the underscore in there. They get a lot of public health tweets. It's probably <laughs> annoying for them. <laughs> talk about that sometime, but I want to pick up with a point that, 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 that David made. Um, if you think about what we're seeing in the United States, just you know, in the past 16 years, so since the start of this, uh, this century, the mortality rate for whites, less educated whites, the mortality rate for rural women has increased. And this is something that we've never seen in the United States. So it does seem like for the first time in our history, or recorded history, for some group of Americans, which is not small, they're going to have a shorter life expectancy than their parents did. And the worry is that when that happens, you start to experience an unprecedented level of disillusionment. And to David's point, I wonder if, to some extent, this is the opioid crisis. And so let's spend some time kind of fleshing out the opioid crisis. You wrote this letter to two and a half million people three months ago. How, does, how do you and how do your office think about what we're up against and what we can do about it? Well, that's a great question. Um, let me just say, first of all, just how happy I am to be here. Uh, the very first conference I ever organized as an undergraduate uh, was actually right here at, at the Institute of Politics. And so we're walking in the door. Uh, brought back all those memories of the wonderful opportunities this institution has afforded me and it has been a great home for me uh, for many years so i'm just very grateful to be back here uh, and to, to be with all of you the question you ask is a really important one uh, and it's one that we think about often in our office because as you can imagine uh, we get requests from people all over the country to focus on various issues those requests come in the form of tweets letters that people send uh, sometimes people will send pictures of their rashes you know, and ask me for an opinion. Uh, and I have to you know, tell them, and unfortunately, I can't give them a diagnosis on the basis of the picture. Uh, but I, I say that actually seriously, because what all of these inquiries point to is the fact that people are really concerned about health, their individual health, the health of their families, the health of their communities. If we look at the numbers, we see some things that are disturbing as well, which is that despite the advances that we've made in medical technology and in medical science more broadly, uh, we still have some really serious problems when it comes to chronic illness. Over the last 20 years, 30 years, we've seen the rates of chronic disease, diabetes and heart disease in particular in our country, uh, increase far beyond what anyone thought they would. We've also seen uh, chronic illnesses that many people may not think about, uh, specifically substance use disorders, also grow in particular pockets, particularly when it comes to opioid use disorders. And for those of you who aren't familiar with opioids, uh, opioids are, uh, or prescription opioids are prescription painkillers, medications like oxycodone, Mor morphine is another example of this, Dilaudid, uh, another. But these are medications which uh, act in similar ways to heroin, in fact. And what we've seen is that the uh, crisis that we've had with opioid, with prescription painkiller addiction, has fed into the heroin crisis that we have uh, and has been fueled in part by cheap heroin that is now more readily available. So we have a lot of challenges that we face, but if we look at the ones that are causing the greatest amount of pain and suffering and causing the greatest amount of healthcare dollars, it really is this explosion of chronic disease uh, that we're facing. Now Amitha mentioned, uh, uh, Professor Chandra mentioned the letter uh, that I had sent out. Uh, this was, in fact, the, the first time in the 145-year history of our office that a call to action had been issued specifically to clinicians in the form of uh, a direct letter of appeal. And the reason I did that uh, around opioids is because 
number one, clinicians have a unique role that they can play um, because of their ability to prescribe, but also because of their ability to help inform and educate communities. But I also believe that the scale of the crisis warranted it. We've seen since 1999 a near quadrupling in the quantity of opioids prescribed, which is tracked with a near quadrupling in the number of overdose deaths from opioids. Uh, and so this requires urgent action right now. And finally, I'll say that part of our, the way that we're going to solve our, the addiction crisis in America uh, is not just through programs and policies, although those are very important, but we have to make an important cultural shift in our country in how we think about and talk about addiction. You know, unlike uh, diabetes or heart disease or cancer, uh, many people don't feel comfortable coming forward and admitting that they have a substance use disorder. I, when I travel around the country, and I will say that one of the great privileges of this job is the opportunity to go and hear directly from people all over America. But when I travel, I have people who are not willing to talk to me if there's a camera anywhere in the vicinity because they're worried that if somebody finds out that they have a problem with addiction, that they'll be fired from their job, mm -hmm. they'll be ostracized by their friends, and that their doctor may even look at them differently. Uh, and they have reason to believe this because of some of their experiences that they have had. And that is why in the uh, report that we issued two weeks ago, which is the first ever Surgeon General's report on alcohol, drugs, and health, uh, we made the case that we do need to invest more in treatment because treatment works. Every dollar we invest in treatment actually saves us $4 in healthcare costs, $7 in criminal justice system costs. When it comes to prevention, we have to invest more there because we have programs that actually return $64 for every dollar invested. And we detail some of these programs. But we also called for that cultural shift in how we think about addiction, how we talk about addiction. Uh, and that's where all of us have power. You might say to yourself, well, hey, I don't write laws. I don't control large budgets. What can I really do to address the addiction crisis in America? Well, you can do a lot. And you can start uh, with thinking about how you talk about addiction and by making it comfortable for people around you to actually share their problems, to create a compassionate and supportive environment for people in your life who may be struggling uh, with a substance use disorder. That is incredibly powerful. And one of the things I wanted to make sure I emphasize, not just in the report, but in everything we do, is the fact that if we are going to overcome the big healthcare challenges we have as a country, it's going to require more than government uh, doing certain things. It's going to require each of us uh, taking it upon ourselves uh, to play a role in creating the solutions that our country really desperately needs. So, but Dr. Murthy, come back to that piece that you just ended with. There's the piece that all of us have to be engaged in and do more of. And then there's the part that you mentioned, that we also do need treatments mm -hmm. for people who have an opioid addiction. And we're in an environment where the president-elect has said that he wants to repeal the ACA, he wants to roll back the Medicaid expansion, and these are both laws that expanded access, in my understanding, to treatments. So on that part about treatments, how do we think about treatments for the opioid epidemic when we're likely to be rolling back exactly the laws that would have helped people most in need for those treatments? Well, so I think in the, in the months ahead, after the new administration begins, uh, we'll have an opportunity to see what policies are proposed and then to assess the impact that those have. But one thing that is very clear is that coverage has to be an important part of what we protect and expand because we know that without coverage, it's hard to get people treatment. And despite the 20 million people who have been enrolled uh, since the passage of the ACA, we still have millions more people, uh, particularly in states that haven't expanded Medicaid, uh, who don't have coverage and hence don't have access to those treatments. And the treatment program is significant because if you actually look at the number of people with substance use disorders mm -hmm. in America, uh, it's 20.8 million, which is actually about similar to the number of people who have diabetes, which is one and a half times wow. the number of people who have all cancers combined. That's how big the addiction crisis is in America. But only one in 10 people with a substance use disorder is actually getting treatment. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment if only one in 10 people with cancer were actually getting treatment, mm. if only one in 10 people with diabetes were getting treatment, would we allow that kind of system mm -hmm. situation to persist? The answer is no. There would be, there would be an outcry, rightly so, uh, saying that this is unjust. We can't deny people life-saving treatment, especially when we have it and we know it works. But that's what's happening right now with substance use disorders. So, you know, we'll have to, you know, right now the new administration hasn't yet taken uh, take an office, and so we haven't seen you know, clear proposals yet of, of what's actually going to happen. 
Um, but as we do, it will be especially important uh, for us all to work together to, uh, to ensure that people are actually not only keeping the coverage they, uh, you know, keeping coverage if they have coverage, but to make sure that, they, that the folks who don't have coverage are getting coverage, because uh, this has to be an important plank uh, of improving health in mm. America. Mm. Mm. You, you know, what's interesting about, we don't have a whole lot of legislative details right now, but one thing we know is that you mm. are one of the few people who's likely to be in the job by statute for two more years, right? So you are, sorry to put any, no pressure here, right? The rest of us come and go, but you're one of the people who will actually be around for two years into a new administration or should be by statute. So again, as an outsider looking at this, it does seem like this is an unusually bipartisan issue. Like there's no group here that should say, we don't really care about treatment. And so on that point, you know, what do you think is the likelihood that this president-elect working with the new Congress is actually able to get all the funding that the country needs well, I'm to very, make progress on this? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And I, I'm actually very optimistic that we can make progress on addressing uh, the substance use uh, crisis that we have in America under the new administration because this is an issue that has been bipartisan actually for a number of years now. You know, I've had the, the pleasure and privilege of working with people on both sides of the aisle on this issue, uh, you know, during my tenure as Surgeon General. And I can tell you that there is a growing recognition uh, among elected leaders in DC that, uh, that this issue affects everyone, that this isn't a partisan issue. It's uh, affecting people who are rich and poor, people of all ethnicities, people in rural and urban areas. Uh, and let me tell you, I've actually not just read this, I've seen this firsthand. You know, I've certainly gone to big cities in America and talk to people whose families and whose communities were devastated by, by addiction. But just a few months ago, I was in Nepuskiak, Alaska. Nepuskiak is a small fishing mm -hmm. village that isn't accessible by road. You have to take a boat to get there. And I went there and visited Nepuskiak, which has less than 500 people. And in this small little building, it's, it's, it's a room actually that's smaller than this uh, area that we're seated in, that small area where they provide care to people who are ill. They told me that that building had been broken into multiple times over the last few years by people who were seeking prescription painkillers. And when they finally, you know, broken several times through the windows and doors, they boarded everything up. And then the intruders came in through the roof. Uh, and even in this small remote village, the opioid crisis has, has reached their door. Uh, and so because of that, unfortunate reality mm -hmm. that not just opioids, but the larger crisis around addiction has affected all parts of our country, there is actually a bipartisan spirit toward addressing it. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that it's a guarantee that good things will happen and that we'll make progress. It still means we have to work hard together to make difficult decisions about how we allocate resources so that we are, in fact, funding treatment, so that we are funding prevention. Uh, but I do have a reason to believe uh, that this is an area where we can make a lot of progress uh, in, the, in the years ahead. So um, on kind of all the things that we have to make progress on, uh, there was an election, right? And, and uh, you know, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people, I'm just thinking about what's happening around here at least, so let me make this a little bit local, are not doing terribly well in terms of their emotional health. Like for lack of a better word, I describe it almost as, I mean, what I experience as a professor is, you know, there's a fair bit of st stress, there was, there's anger. But what I see is something that I've never seen before in, in, in my life is I see fear, right? And, and you're the Surgeon General. So when someone comes to you with those three ailments, how do you respond to them? And the election has happened the way it's happened but can you help us deal with it for those of us? <laughs> well, let me just make this personal because I can speak for myself, uh, you know, who wished for a different outcome. Uh, but, but at the same time, I, I believe in, you know, in, in standing up for what happened. So how do I deal with all the fear and anger and grief that I'm facing? Well. <laughs> and you're a doctor. Well, I have a couch that you can come lie on and we can talk well, about so that's, that a that, more. See, <laughs> that, I'm really worried about that was, that was going to be the answer because... It's not, though. Oh, good, good, yeah, good, it's not the answer. good. Uh, so, you know, look, this was a, a very hotly contested election. People felt really strongly about it, uh, regardless of who you supported. And 
and the, out, the outcome was, you know, was very exciting and thrilling for some and was really disappointing to others. Uh, but what is clear is that regardless of which candidate you're supporting, people are expecting that there will be a lot of change in the future. Mm -hmm. And change is hard. Even change that you want is hard. It can produce, provokes anxiety, it provokes fear. And it actually threatens to tear us apart just at the time where we actually need to come together. So there are a couple of things that I have found myself thinking about um, and that, you know, that I, I share often with, with others, which is number one, during times of change, uh, it's important to think about what you do to preserve your own emotional well-being. And some of us have our own anchors. Uh, those might be good friends that we talk to and confide in. Uh, I will be clear that talking to all friends is not always helpful uh, about issues like this. Some people can amplify your fears, others can assuage them. Um, but social connection is powerful. There are contemplative practices that some people use, but like meditation uh, to help them. Uh, actually, sleep and physical activity are incredibly important and helpful uh, in managing and improving your emotional well-being and dealing with stress. So on a personal level, those are some steps or, or, or avenues to think about which become all the more important uh, during times of change. But going beyond ourself, there's how we actually support each other. And times of change are actually important times to, to reach out and to connect with people in ways that help broaden our understanding uh, of our community and our country. Right? Well, Amitabh and I had, had a chance to talk a little bit earlier, and I was telling him that one of my concerns about America is that we are suffering in isolation. We have millions and millions of people who are suffering in isolation, despite the fact that we live in some of the most connected times. Mm -hmm. right? We have people who have 5,000 friends on Facebook, who have 10,000 followers on Twitter, who live in high-rise buildings with hundreds of fellow residents, but they feel profoundly mm -hmm. alone. Mm -hmm. And this is not a problem we're gonna solve with technology alone. It's a problem that we need to address by thinking about how we rebuild our connections with each other as a community and as a larger country. Uh, my concern about America is that the bonds that hold our diverse country together are fraying. And whether or not they strengthen or continue to fray is dependent on the actions and steps that each of us take in our day-to-day -day lives. You can't pass laws that strengthen the connections between people. Mm -hmm. You can't put out rules you know, from the Department of Health and Human Services or build new programs that overnight that are gonna do that. Those bonds are built person to person, community by community, all across our country. And you might listen to that and say, gosh, that sounds awfully hard. Well, making a democracy work is actually very hard. And doing it in a way that doesn't tear people apart but actually brings them together is very difficult, but it's also very worthwhile. We have had, if we look back in history in our country, we have had moments where we came together, where we put all kinds of other things aside and recognized that more important than our preferences on, on issues and our stance on uh, particular political topics, that what mattered most was our shared humanity. Now, the times we have done that have often been times of tragedy, during 9-11, during times of war, there have been other times, much more rare, like when we came together around putting a man on the moon, uh, when we came together around sports like the Olympics and all rooting for our, you know, our country to win and succeed. Those have been positive moments uh, mm -hmm. that have brought us together. But the challenge that I would put out to you as people who are engaged citizens and who are leaders in our country and our world is to think about what positive, uplifting ideal could now bring our country together, could bring people together to recognize again that shared humanity. We don't need to and shouldn't have to wait for another tragedy in order to come together to achieve a big thing. But in order to bring people together will require somebody to take the first step. Now you might, having just come off of Thanksgiving, have engaged in some difficult conversations over the dinner table uh, with family or friends who may have had different opinions from you. And what you probably know from your own direct experience is that when people dig in, when they castigate and judge each other, that's not a recipe for success. This is something that I was taught very early in medical school uh, when we were taught that in your interactions with patients, um, if a patient is angry at you and they're blaming you, for you to respond in the same way does not help you build a productive relationship. 
but somebody has to pause. Somebody has to create space for compassion, for listening and understanding, and then move forward uh, based on that. And that's actually what we have to do uh, as a community and as a country. Now, how to do that is hard, as I mentioned, but that's a real task that's before us. Uh, so I would just say that as we think about this, to recognize that, number one, you're, you're not alone. Our entire country is faced with the prospect of great change. Uh, and people are struggling with how to deal with that, often feeling isolated in their struggle. And what we can do is to help bridge that isolation while taking care of ourselves and recognizing that a positive, uplifting goal is what our country needs right now. And it's one that we can help to clarify and bring folks together around. So I'm going to ask you another question where I need you to say something positive and uplifting. So, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm an economist, and I warned David Gergen, you know, like I've told you all this before, like inviting one of us to moderate this is like inviting a skunk to the garden party. So, <laughs> so uh, but, but here, um, here, here's something that I think you've been very vocal about, and it played up prominently in your confirmation hearings. We've had Newton, we've had Aurora, we've had Fort Hood, we've had Virginia Tech. And for the first time, I think, again, in history, you know, that slowdown in gun-related violence that we were seeing seems to have gone away. And so in the coming years, what's your sense of, you know, federal gun control or maybe even a shift to the states um, to strengthen gun control measures? Is any of this likely to happen? So th this is a good question. And, and you're right, you know, there was some discussion around some of my tweets around gun violence earlier when I was going through confirmation. Um, but look, what I, what, I, what I said then is actually, uh, it's a truism. It's actually not a point of controversy, which is that uh, gun violence is a, a public health issue. I don't know of anybody out there who supports gun violence. Um, and you know, when you are injured and are at risk for dying, I think that's considered a health issue. So you know, the fact that gun violence is a health issue is not the part that's controversial. The part that gets controversial is how do you address that? What do you do about it? And that's where, unfortunately, the issue has become politicized. But the politicization of gun violence actually takes us away from, I think, what is a more um, comprehensive approach that we need to take toward violence in America, which is that, number one, yes, you know, we do need uh, sensible gun laws in our country so that people who are uh, you know, a threat to others uh, you know, can't pick up a weapon and commit a mass murder. But we also need uh, more investment in mental health as a country. We need, uh, while recognizing that not everybody who commits uh, an act mm -hmm. of gun violence is mentally ill. In fact, folks who are mentally ill are more likely to be the victims of gun violence than anything else. But the third thing is we know that we also need more focus on gun safety so that parents with young kids know that when you leave a child alone at home with an unlocked and loaded weapon, that that puts them at grave risk. And they may sound obvious to you. It is not obvious to everyone because we have tragedies that happen all too often in our country where a toddler gets a hold of a gun and uh, injures or kills himself or herself and sometimes other people. But there's a fourth thing that we have to do that we don't talk about nearly often enough. We have to ask the question, why does violence exist in the first place? What's actually the root cause of violence? And to me, when I think about that, I, I see violence often as an expression of pain. And pain exists uh, when we have a void, when we have a gap in our own emotional well-being. And we have to think of what is the way to fill that gap. You know, it turns out that science tells us that there are actually ways that we can improve our emotional well-being. You know why this is important? It's important because many people assume that emotional well-being is something that happens to you. If I happen to have the right relationship, the right job, live in you know, the right mm -hmm. building, mm -hmm. get the right you know, choice of dorms, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. uh, then I can be emotionally well. But increasingly what, what we have learned through science is that there are in, techniques and tools that you can use to actually improve your emotional well-being, many of which I mentioned earlier, you know, including social connection, sleep, exercise, contemplative practices like meditation, gratitude exercises. There are others as well. But my point is that if we recognize that emotional well-being is an area that we can proactively cultivate that can impact uh, not only uh, violence, but other health outcomes, educational outcomes, workplace productivity, then 
we can invest more in that area. We can bring more focus to it. And that's in fact exactly what our office uh, is working on now, is an initiative around emotional well-being, uh, where we can help expand the science around this area, help expand practice as well, so more people have access to benefits uh, of emotional well-being programs. Uh, if you'll indulge me, I'll just tell you one example, actually, of, uh, of an emotional well-being program that I encountered that's really quite remarkable. Uh, I had heard uh, through the newspaper and through the news media about this school out in California uh, that was, it was a middle school that was doing some interesting work uh, on using meditation. And I thought to myself, I want to go out there and see what this school is actually doing, how they're getting sixth graders to actually meditate, and how it's having the profound effects that they're writing about. And this is a story that I learned. I learned that this school, unlike many schools in San Francisco, was actually in one of the toughest parts uh, of, of town. That the violence rate was incredibly high, that over 50 people had been murdered in a single year uh, in this small community. That in several cases, as horrifying as this is, uh, the bodies had actually been dumped on the school property. And in a small community, the kids often knew someone uh, who knew the, per the victim or knew the victim directly. So you imagine how traumatizing this is uh, to children. And in that school, not, shock not surprisingly, uh, the suspension rates were high, grades were poor, teacher burnout uh, was high, and they just didn't know what to do. After trying a series of programs, the principal took a risk. He said, you know what? I heard about this meditation uh, stuff. I don't know a whole lot about it. Uh, but if there's even a small chance that it'll help our kids, let's try and get it in here and see what we can do. So he asked a researcher who was studying meditation and its impact on kids uh, to set up a program. And they did, called the Quiet Time Program, which is 15 minutes of meditation twice a day, in the morning and in the evening, in the morning and in the afternoon before school ended. And I, when I went there, I said to him, I said, what is the first thing you noticed? Hmm. He said, well, within the first couple of weeks, we noticed that the volume in the hallways was going down. He said, then I noticed that the whiteboard outside my office, where they used to keep the names of all the teachers who had called in sick that day, that list got shorter and shorter and shorter until one day there were no names on the list. That hadn't happened in a long time. Within the first year, they noticed a 45% drop in suspensions, a 30% reduction in teacher absenteeism, grade point averages and test scores went up, the self-reported anxiety and sleep disturbances of the students went down, and the self-reported happiness scores of the students, a measure that is uh, part of, I believe, the state's annual survey, went from being one of the, this school went from being one of the lowest rated schools in the entire district to in one year being the highest rated school, and four years being the highest in the entire state of California. Now this program has actually been replicated in other schools with similar results. And when I went there to talk to them, there was a young man uh, that I met there, a uh, young African-American student, um, who told me that he, he said he grew up in very hard circumstances. His mom left when they were really young. His mom, in fact, had a substance use disorder uh, and left when he was just a small child. Uh, his father had to keep three jobs just to support him and the family. Uh, when he went to school, he encountered a lot of racism. Other kids telling him that he wouldn't amount to anything in school because he was black, and that made him angry. And he became an angry person, and he started bullying other kids. When he started meditating, he initially thought it was He's, he, he, this is literally his words. He's like, oh, this is all, I thought this was all crap. I didn't know what this was all about. But then he kind of gave it a chance, and because everyone else was starting to do it, he thought, okay, he had some good coaches there, so he said, okay, I'll just try it. And he had this ex experience where he actually felt a moment of calm. And that was transformative for him. Because he said, hold on, this whole time, I thought that I was an angry person. But I just had that moment of calm, and you know what? It felt good. So he started meditating more, and he found that when he was in a confrontational situation, He'd remember that moment of calm, he would take a deep breath and he would pause before reacting. He found all the kids that he had bullied and he apologized to them. He said, I didn't know who I was back then, but I would never do that to you again. His story was actually not unusual. It was a typical story I heard from kids in that middle school and kids at the nearby high school that had implemented the same program. And my point is this, that we have incredible treasured places like Visitation Valley Middle School in California and others that are implementing these extraordinary emotional well-being programs that are having a dramatic impact on health, educational outcomes, uh, and in even some cases on workplace productivity. There's a program in Chicago which in one year has reduced violent arrests by 44 percent. 
the Becoming a Man program. It makes sense to me that if we want to reduce violence in America, these are the kind of programs we should be thinking about. This is the kind of place where we should be putting our research dollars. This is the kind of conversation about how to improve emotional well-being in America, about how to get to the root of violence that we should be having. Because when I have those conversations all across America, I'll tell you that they are not controversial, that they don't get stalemated uh, you know, in controversy. But we have this, in, unfortunately, in our society, uh, and you know, in part in our news media, we have a penchant for conflict. Right? We like to put conflict because it gets ratings. And I, I don't blame the media entirely for that. They, they do it because the public responds to it. But we have to make a choice about what kind of conversation we want to have as a country, not just about violence, but about issues across the board. Do we want to be mired in conflict all the time? Or do we want to actually have productive discussions? Do we want to support people who are having productive discussions? And do we want to step up and be a part of the solution? If we make the choice to be a part of that solution, to have those constructive conversations, then I'm incredibly hopeful that we can solve what seem like intractable problems like violence. I could listen to you forever. You're like at the 99th percentile of Surgeon Generals. You're just like <laughs> really, really good. So um, this is your all's opportunity to ask um, Dr. Murthy questions. So there are two mics down here and two mics um, up here in the middle that, that I'm pointing to. So feel free to come down and ask your question. What I do request is that uh, you introduce yourself, uh, keep the question brief, and definitely end with a question mark. So. <laughs> Cornelia, show us how it's done. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Cornelia Hall. I'm a second year public policy student here studying health policy. Um, and uh, you know, you've talked about this a bit already in terms of emotional well-being. But as you know, you know, health status for an individual or population relies on a lot of different things that aren't just clinical. It's, you know, housing, social supports, transportation, all kinds of things have effects on, on health. So as you know, the sort of clinician in chief, I was wondering what you think about <laughs> Uh, the role of the medical community on, you know, trying to improve health statuses that might rely on a lot of these other things. You know, do hospitals are using care managers and stuff like that, but to, you know, where should they stop and where should other social, you know, services step mm. in in the community um, to solve health problems? Well, thanks for that question, Cornelia. This is, a, this is a really important question. And when I think about what the job of a clinician is, I think that the job of a clinician is to safeguard the health of a community, period. It's not to deliver only specific types of care. It's not to only do procedures. It's not to only operate in a clinic or in a hospital. To me, what that means is that we have to look at the inside and outside strategy for improving health. The inside strategy is focusing on what people do in their own lives and their own practices, things like emotional well-being practices, nutrition, physical activity, and, you know, and the rest. But there's an outside strategy as well where we know we have to improve the environment in which people live because poverty, access to food, mm -hmm. uh, unsafe neighborhoods, these are all powerful, powerful determinants of health. And so we have to do both. This is not about choosing the environment mm -hmm. over internal mm -hmm. change. It's not about choose a suck it up strategy versus a uh, nothing is uh, you know, in your control strategy. We gotta do both. But as far as clinicians go, I actually think that this is the time where clinicians doctors, nurses, pharmacists, dentists, and others have to think intentionally and broadly about what their role is, where it's no longer enough for us to sit in our hospitals and clinics and hope that the healthcare system gets fixed or hope that social determinants get addressed. But in fact, we need to step up and be that voice that calls for some of that change. I'll give you a very simple example. As when I talk to mayors around the country, there are a number of issues that they bring up with me. But in recent times, uh, many of them have brought up the question of e-cigarettes. And they've said, mm -hmm. well, are these e-cigarettes, are they OK, are they not? We don't know whether to include them in clean indoor mm -hmm. air laws. We're not sure what to do, et cetera. And I have thought to myself, if we had clinicians in America who were connected with their mayors and could actually help them on public health issues like this and understanding the fact that nicotine is, in fact, a highly addictive substance, that most e-cigarettes, in fact, have nicotine, that nicotine, in fact, has adverse effects on the developing brain of adolescents, and that kids shouldn't be smoking or using e-cigarettes because it's potentially bad for their health. If there are simple things like that that clinicians can help policymakers understand, it can help guide more informed policy. Similarly, if they are able to work with 
faith-based organizations on helping educate communities about nutrition. If they're able to work with uh, grocery stores and with chains about, and with hospitals themselves about the food offerings that we have in, in our community, that could be incredibly powerful as well. This requires reimagining and broadening the scope of what clinicians do. And finally, I'll just say this. Many clinicians will listen to this and say, whoa, 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 hold on. I've already got so much mm -hmm. to do. My plate is overflowing. Every week I get somebody asking me to do mm -hmm. this and check that test and do this screen, screening for this illness, et cetera. Where am I supposed to begin? And look, I understand because I've been in that situation, right? I've been caring for patients and have had this experience thinking, gosh, I need more hours in the day. How am I possibly going to do more? But this is why, like, this is not the burden that we put on each physician to add more to their, uh, to their daily schedule. This is actually a larger structural and cultural conversation we need to have as a profession. Because if we want to make it possible for doctors and nurses in their communities to be a part of addressing social determinants of health, that means we have to rethink how we're training uh, medical students and residents. It means that we have to rethink how we're structuring clinical jobs so that a part of that is actually dedicated to community engagement and community work. And so that value is actually seen uh, in that work. Whereas right now, we have a system which places, I believe, far too much value on someone's publications. And I realize I'm saying that in an academic institution my own alma mater, but it has to be said, you know, because there are other ways to contribute to the world other than publishing a paper as helpful as that is. Thank you. So just a quick follow up on that. You know, a lot of people here are from Harvard College. You were mm -hmm. here as an undergraduate at the college. What are the courses that, you know, speaking of the pipeline that goes back so many years that you wish you had taken? Mm -hmm. well, what kind of advice would you have, in other words, for people who are thinking about being the next Surgeon General? You know, I, I, I was a biochemical sciences major. And I really wish I had taken more courses in the arts and the humanities. And the reason I say that is because the more I not just live life, but the more I have this privilege of having a window into people's lives, both as a doctor and a surgeon general, the more I realize that uh, science doesn't explain everything, right? And we need to be able to understand the, um, the other aspects of people's, of their lives, of their souls. Uh, we need to understand how people express themselves. And art is one of the most beautiful uh, venues through which people capture the human experience. And humanities are often, can give us powerful vehicles for also how to capture stories. Mm -hmm. Storytelling is at, at the heart of medicine uh, in a lot of ways, but it gets sidelined a lot in the focus on uh, quote unquote hard science. Um, but I wish I had spent even more time in the arts and humanities because to better understand the stories of people, uh, to better master myself the art of storytelling and of listening, uh, that would have been a wonderful skill to have strengthened uh, during my undergraduate years. If I can, I'd actually want to say one more thing about that I wish I had done that's not related to a course, mm -hmm. which is that I actually wish I had paid more attention to the public sector when I was in college. When I was in college, I primarily thought, okay, you know, maybe I'll you know, work at a nonprofit, maybe I'll start my own medical practice, maybe, who knows, maybe I'll work in a company. But the idea of actually working in government was not one that really occurred to me very often. In fact, I'll be completely honest with you, I thought that government was a vehicle for creating change that was far too slow and far too incremental for my taste. That's how I thought about it, like when I was younger. I also would read these stories uh, in the newspaper about the people who served in government uh, and they didn't always paint them in a very positive light. Hmm. So I thought to myself, why would I want to work with people who seem to be described in hmm. a, such a negative manner in a vehicle that's not great at creating change that our country needs? Why would I want to do that? And I've since realized that that was actually a very uh, flawed perception of government. Because what I've had the privilege to see uh, during my time in the federal government has been, number one, that there are incredibly talented and committed people in government. You don't see them on uh, the headlines of papers all the time. They're often hard at work, late at night, you know, in the shadows where no one's looking, but they're doing work that makes the lives that we lead possible. Uh, and the opportunity to see that these folks are there because they're mission driven, they could earn three times the salary in the private sector, but they choose to be in government because they see that they can contribute. That was powerful for me to see. The second thing though, is that I've realized is that we actually need more people like that in government. Mm -hmm. And that means more people like you. If our country becomes a place where the most talented people are not attracted to government, where they choose to go elsewhere 
because they feel a government's not a place where their talents can be used, that is very, very bad for our country. And we, none of us, being members of a democracy, have the luxury of saying that making government work is somebody else's problem, because it's our problem. And if government doesn't work, it impacts all of us. If people aren't informed when they vote, that impacts all of us. And if we're not helping to inform the public, but also to make government work, then we're not being part of the solution. And that's what our country really needs now, is it needs young, talented people to step up, to be a part of the solution. And joining government is actually one way to do that. And so I want to share that with you because I realize that from the outside looking into government, it can at times appear like an unattractive place to be. But I'll tell you that some of the most idealistic people that I have met, some of the most impressive leaders that I've come across are people I've met in the last two years in Washington, D.C., and in state and local governments around the country, people who are doing incredible things across party lines, and they're actually changing people's lives and saving people's lives. And every time somebody like that comes into government, they inspire all the people around them. People who stand up and wake up and say, hey, I never thought that somebody like you who would actually be in government. I never thought you could do all this kind of uh, cool work and that you could create real change in government. But I'm here to tell you that it's possible. And I'm here to tell you that we need more people in government like you who are talented. So that's something I wish I had woken mm -hmm. up to earlier because if I had, I'll tell you this, I probably would have done more uh, in, in government during my training. I probably would have either done internships or uh, taken a job you know, just to see what it was like. Um, who knows, maybe I would have even contemplated running for office. Who knows, you know? But if you find yourself complaining that you don't have good candidates to vote for, mm -hmm. then the next question should be, well, what about you? What about you? And as crazy as that seems, uh, that's a question that all of us have to be asking now, is what role can we play right now to make our government work better and to make our country work better? Thank you for that. Thank you. Let's go up to the second level. Dr. Murthy, thank you much. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, my name is Sagar Deshpande. I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Michigan and a first year MPP student here at the Kennedy School. Um, my, my question to you is, uh, uh, as most people here know, funding for research has been ever dwindling um, in the biomedical sciences and is becoming increasingly more competitive uh, for physicians looking to uh, enter the world of biomedical research to compete for increasingly scarce, scarce doctors, uh, dollars. Um, there, there is new funding coming in, but the perception among people like me and my classmates uh, frequently is that research is difficult, it is unproductive to your career because you're gonna get cut off with your funding, um, it's hard and uh, the pay line just keeps going up for K awards and things like that. Is there any national effort to kind of remediate that perception or to try to ensure that that bridge between clinical practice and biomedical science is a strong one? So great question, Sagar. Let me do one thing, actually, if you don't mind, and with your permission, Amitabh. Sure. In the interest of time, since we're running short, why don't I just take three questions at once and then I'll synthesize an answer for all of them. Would that work? <laughs> is that okay with if you? If you're a magician, yeah, in no, addition I mean, to no. being a doctor, <laughs> yes, I love it, yeah. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm Carl, my uh, first year fellow at Brigham and Women in General Medicine. My question uh, relates to my experience before going into medicine. I was a bouncer at a bar in Chicago, and recognizing when somebody's overserved and saying, no, you can't come in, I would recognize, well, they're just gonna go down to the next bar and find somebody else to serve them. Um, as a physician, I'm in the same role now with opioids, whereas I recognize I can't keep prescribing, but I do know they're gonna find a doctor who will. So I'm wondering how we address that, both on a local level, but also on, with, through policy. Great question, thank you. I'll take one more. Let's go upstairs, yep. Hi, uh, my name is Ben Bolger and I'm a Harvard alumnus and I have a, just a holistic question. Historically, it used to be that you'd ask someone, you know, how do they die and you know, the obituary might say of natural causes or you'd speak to a doctor and they would casually say of old age. At Harvard, there is a focus on regenerative medicine. We are researching stem cell research at extreme levels. Elsewhere, there's cryogenic preservation. My question, like Dr. Sanjay Gupta and others have talked about, perhaps we will come eventually to view aging as a disease. So when I'm, as a holistic question, do you think the view of being old 
and changing our prioritization of caring for people that are old should or will change, that we will look at aging itself as something that is treatable through research and should be a prioritization. Hmm. These are all great questions. <laughs> you know, so a, a couple of thoughts I would share on these. You know, I'd say, as far as the research is concerned, you, uh, funding for research is a concern I hear everywhere. And you're right that there is uh, uncertainty around funding, which makes young people wary of going into the research professions. And that makes people who have been in it for 20 or 30 years wary about continuing uh, in their careers. And so I, I get that. You know, I've um, certainly had conversations with folks at NIH and elsewhere who share these similar concerns. Uh, the question that I would ask you is for all of those who are concerned about our research funding, um, I want to know what you've done with that concern. H have you actually voiced that concern to your elected officials? Uh, have you shared that concern uh, through letters to the editor uh, in your local paper? And the reason I ask you this is uh, not to, you know, not to make you feel bad or to feel guilty, but just to tell you that that is actually, those are routes through which we can actually push for the kind of change that we need, uh, which is more stable uh, funding uh, for research going forward. Um, we shouldn't be in an environment where our ability to do good science is threatened, you know, based on the budget cycle. Uh, that's not a recipe for success when we're a, sci a society that has advanced so much based on science, but it's going to require people who are particularly close to the situation, researchers, clinicians, uh, and trainees, uh, to, to voice their opinion to their elected leaders to, so they know that this is a need that not just a couple people have, but that our entire country faces. I'll also say when it comes to opioids, uh, to Carl's question, that, look, saying no to a patient is one of the hardest things to do, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I remember very vividly uh, patients who, who I've sat across the table from and have had to uh, say no about a prescription that they asked for with re you know, regard to prescription painkillers because I felt strongly that it was actually more risk than benefit for them. But this is not the only scenario, Carl, where we face this. We've dealt with this with antibiotics, right, where we know uh, that as a country we've had a problem with the overuse of antibiotics. And part of what we had to do as a country was not only educate clinicians about the proper use of antibiotics, uh, but also support them by setting up antibiotic stewardship committees in, in hospitals. But we had to do a lot of public education so that parents knew that if your child has an ear infection, that taking the child to the pediatrician and getting antibiotics may not actually always be the best solution. You should take them to the pediatrician, but it might be that supportive care without antibiotics is actually what's better for them in the longer run. And now, today, even though we haven't solved our problems with antibiotic resistance, I have more and more pediatricians who tell me that it's easier to have that conversation because more parents have heard that antibiotics may not always be good. And this is the case with opioid medications as well, uh, where we have a lot of public education to do. I find that a lot of times people, uh, when I travel, will tell me, how could it be that a doctor would write a prescription for something that could actually cause harm? That doesn't make sense to me. And so on the basic point that op prescription painkillers, prescription opioids are addictive, we still have a lot of work to do uh, when it comes to the public, but that public education can help. Aging is part of, it's part of life, <laughs> and we know that our bodies break down in various ways over time. But I think if you look at 50 years ago, uh, what was considered normal aging, we have changed the, we've changed the assumptions there. We've extended the lifespan over the last several hundred years because of the advances that we've made uh, in medicine and science. My belief and my hope is that we can continue to do that. Uh, now this doesn't mean, what we have to be careful about is, this doesn't mean that we should see death as a failure or that we should look at, uh, you know, that we should sort of give up on, um, I don't know, we shouldn't see death as a failure is my point because we know um, that while living a good life is important, that that transition uh, to the end of life is also very important. Uh, and if we make people feel that succumbing to an illness uh, is failure on their part, uh, that is a very stressful uh, state to be in. And I've seen patients uh, go through this. I've cared for patients who have struggled with death at the end of their life, feeling that um, they need to hold on, they need to find some way to battle this back, and that um, if, we, if they don't, that it's either a failure on their part or a failure of medical science. Um, but that is a very anxious way uh, to manage uh, chronic illness. So we have to keep this search on uh, for better treatments that will help people uh, stave off illness for longer. Uh, and I do think that we will do more of that in the future. Uh, but we have to do so, I think, with 
uh, thoughtfully in a way that doesn't make people feel like death uh, means that they failed. So Dr. Murthy, we could keep this going forever, but I know your time is limited, so I'm gonna bring things to a close. We are at a place that many of us think is the world's largest and most powerful incubator of people who are committed to government and public service. So thank you for what you said about government and thank you for coming to the Institute of Politics for this event tonight. Um, our motto here at the Kennedy School is, you know, ask what you can do. And thank you for all that you have done for us and for the United States. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Amitabh, thank you for, for having me here. I want to thank uh, David Gergen also for inviting me uh, to be here with you. Uh, look, this has been, uh, for me, a, a wonderful uh, opportunity to just reflect uh, with you a little bit on some of the uh, experiences that I have in the job and some of my thoughts for our country. But there, this is a very important moment uh, for our country and for the world because it's not just our country that was, is struggling with change. Mm -hmm. There are countries all across uh, the globe uh, that are in the midst of ferocious battles internally about what kind of country they wanna live in, what kind of change they ultimately wanna see. And those debates are determined by the people who show up. And that's why we have to be a society that participates. We can no longer be a society where people sit on the sidelines choosing other pursuits uh, other than government and democracy because those are too hard. Uh, and there's a lot at stake here. Uh, you know, some of you come from families that have been here for generations. And some of you uh, come from families that are new uh, to America. My own family came uh, to America uh, when I was very young, when I was three years old. And they, my parents are from India originally, and they came to America, despite a great deal of hardship, despite coming from incredibly humble uh, beginnings, because they believed that this was a place where their children, my sister and I, would be judged not on the color of our skin or how funny our name sounded, mm -hmm. but by the caliber of our ideas and our willingness to work hard, our willingness to serve. And, you know, I stand here before you, I sit here before you, fully aware that I have been blessed with a realization of that dream that they came to this country seeking. I've been the recipient of the best parts of America. And that's not to say it's always been easy. I encountered racism growing up. I was bullied growing up because of where my parents came from. Uh, those left scars. Uh, those were challenging times. It hasn't all, we, all been easy. But I also sit here knowing that there are few other countries in the world where the grandson of a poor farmer from India could grow up to be asked by the President of the United States uh, to look out for the health of the entire nation. That's a powerful American story. And thankfully, it's not the only powerful American story. There are many other stories, including the stories of many of you in this room, that demonstrate what our country can be in its best moments. But not everyone is experiencing that. And so the question that's facing our country right now is do we continue to suffer in isolation or do we come together, strengthen our connections once again with one another and lift each other up so that we can rise truly as one country? And that's a question that you have to answer and you have to answer it through your actions, through the decisions that you make about where you serve, about what you do, about what conversations you choose to engage in, about whether you pause to listen during that moment where someone is dissenting from you, when you're thinking about the kind of environment you create in your research lab, in your hospital, in your workplace, or in your school. The decisions we make are what shape the environment in our country. Uh, and there is no more important time than right now for us to think about that environment because there are a lot of people in pain in this country. And I'm not talking about the election. Mm -hmm. 
I'm talking about the challenges of day-to-day -day life that have beat so many people down and have made them feel uh, that they're alone. You know, people who experience and feel social isolation, they die earlier, they experience cognitive decline at earlier ages, they have a greater incidence of cardiovascular disease, and I could go on and on. But this is the challenge that I worry about most for our country. But the good news is that we can be a part of rebuilding those connections. You don't need a medical degree to do that. And you don't need to finish school in order to start being a part of the solution. That's something my grandfather passed on uh, to me through my father very early on. He was very poor. His, mother, his wife had just died, leaving him with six children to raise on his own. And even though it was hard to make ends meet, even though they would each night dilute the dal or grain that they boiled uh, you know, for dinner so that there was enough to go around, despite how hard circumstances were, he still made it a point to go from village to village, at least for one month out of the year, raising money to build a youth hostel so that other students could study. And people would say to him, you're so irresponsible. Your own family can't eat. And here you are raising money for other children. What are you doing? And he would just pause and he would say, those kids are our kids too. Those people are our people too. And that's the spirit that we have to renew in America because we have too often retreated to our corners to be with the people who are like us, who think like us, who support our points of view. We have forgotten that at the end of the day, we are and always will be, whether we choose to recognize it or not, one big family. And what do you families do when things get tough? They don't, all in the, they don't always stay together, but the families that do work are ones that recognize that even if you violently disagree with what someone else is saying, you give them the benefit of the doubt. You're there to support them. You help them out. That's what families do during crises. And that's what we have to do right now as a country. So I'm just glad to be here because I know that I'm looking out on the leaders, not just of the future, but leaders today who can actually help make America that connected nation again, that can help us become that kind of country that can fulfill the promises and live up to the values that brought so many of us and our ancestors uh, to these shores. Uh, and if we step up in that way, uh, then I'm confident that we have a bright future. Uh, and, you know, and I just want to thank all of you again for, for having me here, for your interest in this topic, and for being uh, that solution uh, that our country really needs right now. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you.